All right, principles of communication. Principles of communication. It's always a good one I like to preach every now and then because misunderstanding and miscommunication are issues that we all deal with in our lives, right? Why? Because we live in a world of sinners, infallible people, and we can't read each other's minds, right? So this is why, I mean, we could read each other's minds. I mean, that would be a scary thing, first of all. But, uh, you know, but, you know, it would definitely clear up uh, misunderstandings, wasn't, wouldn't it, if you, if you knew what people are thinking when they communicated uh, their thoughts. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 10, verse 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. So you see how the Bible is telling us here, when there's a lot of words spoken, it's, there's no lacking. If you see, if you're not wanting anything, it means that you don't desire or need anything, so you're not lacking. It's saying in a multitude of words, there's no lack of sin, is there? So the more people talk, the more they end up transgressing with their own mouth, maybe the thoughts or offending other people or, or whatnot, and the more words that are spoken, the more trouble you can get yourself in. And that's why it says here, he that refraineth his lips is wise. So that doesn't mean, refrain doesn't mean that you never talk, but you have some control over what you say. And that's definitely, definitely a wise thing. So you see how miscommunication, misunderstanding, uh, these are things that uh, happen to all of us. And the principles of communication, I think, are very important that we know from the Bible. And, uh, you know, it's very applicable to our lives. I mean, you, oftentimes when I preach on topics like this, people may be thinking, is Victor preaching this because something happened in church? Or is Victor preaching this because of me? Uh, maybe I am. So, you know, uh, who, I guess you'll never know, right? So if the, they say about preaching, hey, the shoe fits, wear it. You know, it applies. If you think it applies to you, then good. Apply it to yourself. That's how we should always pay attention to preaching anyway. You know, when you hear preaching, you shouldn't first apply it to somebody else and go, yeah, you know, that person really needs this. I'm glad Victor's preaching it today. <laughs> you know, it should be, hey, I, am I doing this first? Make sure I'm removing the beam from my own eye before I remove the moat from my brother's eye. So you can save yourself, you know, a lot of strife, you know, if you learn um, some biblical principles. But, you know, make sure you do them. You know, if you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, I mean, you're like, like the Bible says, you're like somebody who looks in the mirror and uh, you straightway forget what manner of man you are. So you want to learn some biblical principles and you want to do them. Um, now, the other thing is, it's not only in your personal life where this is, a pro uh, this is where you want to apply these principles. Also within the church. I mean, here, what it says here in Galatians 5.13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Uh, so that's freedom, right? That's the liberty to be able to do things. Also use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So he's saying here the purpose of liberty is not just so that you can serve yourself and serve your own flesh and your own lust, but the, the liberty there to actually love. Because if you didn't have freedom, how can you love somebody? It's like why we have free will. Why do we have free will? Because if we, had, we didn't have free will, then what is love? If you don't have the option to disobey or the option to hate somebody. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. I just love the, uh, the analogy there and the, and the picture that's being uh, drawn here of people uh, backbiting and talking one, against one another and things happening within any sort of community, right? It doesn't have to be the church, but just a, a bunch of people that end up knowing each other more and getting closer. Uh, there's always going to be some strife there. We need to be aware of that and need to think about how we communicate and how we talk to one another and talk about one another because you don't want to bite and devour one another. I mean, think about that picture there of just the cannibalism of people just consuming one another and destroying it from the inside. Um, that's what happens and we need to be aware of that. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So you can't completely avoid strife. Right? Because we know that in the multitude of words there wanteth not sin. And, we don't, and you also don't want to go the complete opposite direction. So whilst there's a, there's a side of communication where you want to take caution and think about how you say things, try not to offend if you can't, um, and things like that. And, but the, on the other side of the spectrum, sometimes people are so risk averse that you don't want to completely avoid strife by not risking 
you know, building relationships with other people. Because sometimes you need to risk offence to build relationships. You know, like ask, talk to people, you know, and ask them about them. And you never know what you might say or you might ask where people, you know, maybe you don't like what you say or don't like what you're asking, but you're just trying to build a relationship. So, you know, it's, it's obviously two-way communication. So you don't want to go the complete opposite direction which is, oh, you know what, I don't want to talk to anyone because I just don't want to risk, you know, it's too troublesome and that what, not, uh, and whatnot. Because we still want to build relationships with people. And you know what, you can minimise the risk following these principles, uh, but never eliminate it. You know, and I, I, I need this sermon just as much as you guys. So it's not like I preach these sermons just because I, I think you guys need it. Sometimes I'm thinking about it myself and I think, you know what, I'm going to remind myself and also share this with you guys as well, the thoughts that I'm having. So, like with anything else in life, you only get better at things with practice. And it's the same with communication. You know, the more you talk and the more you, you know, tr do these things, uh, the better you get at it as well. So communication skills are no different. Now, we started off this sermon, and the Bible reading was in Joshua 22. I just like this passage of Scripture, if you're not familiar with this story. I just feel that it's a good example in the Old Testament of miscommunication and you can see here uh, as you we go through this story just in a few verses of it um, you know you can relate it to just how people respond to miscommunication and assumptions today right so let's just look at a few passages in this story in Joshua 22 so the context of the story is if you remember when they came out of Egypt they went through the wilderness and before they went into the promised land and they had all the wars there was two and a half tribes of the nation of uh, Israel that wanted to actually uh, inherit land on one side of Jordan rather than the other side of Jordan. And um, basically they said, oh, you know, we'll set up things here. And then Moses was saying to them, look, well, you can't, uh, you know, you can't let your brethren go to war while you are all comfortable and all set up on the other side of Jordan. And they said, no, no, no. We'll set up and we'll build houses for our family and whatnot, but we'll go into battle with you so we don't discourage our brethren and help them claim that inheritance. And then once all the wars are finished, we'll go back over across the Jordan River and, and go back to the land that we inherited on this side. So in Joshua 22, you know, Joshua is 24 chapters, so it's near the end of uh, the book of Joshua. But now all those wars are over and now they're going back over to... Um, their lands over on the other side of Jordan. And when, they cut, and when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, so that's the two and a half tribes that were on the other side of Jordan, built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see. So now they've crossed back over the river, right, Jordan, and now they've built an altar on one side of the Jordan River. And the children of Israel heard say, so they hear, behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. Now, why was, this such a, why was this a big deal to build an altar over on the other side of Jordan? Because there was only certain places that they were meant to go, you know, to, to worship the Lord. And obviously that was over on the other side of the Jordan River. So they're saying, you know, you go back to your lands and the first thing you do is like you build an altar on the other side of Jordan. And they're thinking like, what are you going to do? You're going to sacrifice your offerings there? You're going to bring the wrath of God on us. So you can see here that they've seen somebody do something and immediately they've jumped to conclusions, right? They've assumed what they're going to do. And you see here that they even gather themselves together to go and fight against their brethren, not even clearing up first why they're doing it. So you can see how that applies to miscommunication and misunderstanding because that's often how it starts where you know, you, somebody does something or somebody says something and rather than clarifying what did they mean by that, why did you do that, trying to hear their point of view first, you immediately get offended. You know, it's like they get offended and now they're just going to approach their brethren ready to fight rather than ready to listen. Right? So we see here that's what's happening. We'll skip down to verse 16. Thus say it, 
the whole congregation of the Lord. What trespass is this that you've committed against the God of Israel? So notice that when they do go and approach their brethren, it's not first asking, hey, why did you do this? You know, what, what is the meaning of this? They immediately go in you know, the, with the spirit to want to go to war and they're immediately accusing straight away. Like, you know, why are you doing this? What trespass is this? That you've committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord. And that you've builded you an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord. So now they're referring to other things. So now it's like, uh, you know, when you have an argument with somebody, you start bringing up the past as well. You know, bring up all that, that past dirt. Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us from which we are not cleansed until this day? although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord, and it will be, seeing ye rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth, and take possession among us, but rebel not against the Lord, nor rebel against us in building you an altar, Beside the altar of the Lord our God, did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and Ra fell on all the congregation of Israel, and that man perished not alone in his iniquity. So that was their response. Right? They go up to war against them. That's Israel's reaction. And then we see the explanation from the two and a half tribes, right? the three tribes that responded uh, to this accusation. Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel he shall know. So this is a good example as well of how to not be offended so easily if somebody comes at you with an accusation. If somebody comes at you, they're angry, they're accusing you of things, you know, you have good reason for why you did or why you said things and you want to explain it to them. You can take great comfort and not just get so offended straight away and escalate the situation. You can de-escalate the situation by knowing, you know what, God knows the truth. He knows why I did it. He knows what I said. He knows what I meant by it. I have peace at least with my Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what, now I'm going to let this person know and now they're going to know, right? And we do that in the right spirit as well. He knoweth, and Israel, he shall know, if it be in rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. So we're saying, hey, you're going to know whether are we doing it in transgression of the Lord or, verse 23, that we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord or if to offer, burnt, offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering or to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. So that's the first scenario. That's what they're being accused of. Right, here's the other one. Or if, and if we have not rather done it, for fear of this thing, saying, in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, What have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad. Ye have no part in the Lord, so shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. So you see how they're saying, No, no, we've actually built this altar here to remind our children one day that we were the one nation. So one day you might say to our children, hey, God has made the Jordan River a separation between us. You don't have any part with us. So they're actually building it in memorial, not to actually offer sacrifices on, which would be in rebellion against what God has commanded. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifice, but, it, that, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings. That your children may not say to our children in time to come, ye have no part in the Lord. Therefore said we that it shall be when they should so say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, behold, the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made. So you see how it's there just to remind them hey, what the altar was like. Not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. You see, so it was a witness to say, hey, we are part of the nation of Israel. We do have a part with the Lord. This is what the altar that we were to sacrifice looked like. But God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and turn this day from following the Lord to build an altar for burnt offerings, for meat offerings, or for sacrifices beside the altar of the Lord our God that is before his tabernacle. And when Phineas the priest 
and the princes of the congregation and heads of the thousands of Israel which were with him heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake. It pleased them. So you see, like once they heard the explanation, they were fine with that. So then you've got to think, well, the situation should have really been the other way around, right? It should have been, they should have went there first to hear the words and get the explanation. They could have just went there and then went away happy. But because they jumped to conclusions, they made false accusations, they went in saying those false accusations. You know, luckily, the two and a half tribes had the right spirit to de-escalate that situation and explain to them, and they left with peace. But, you know, not every situation is, is, uh, is that fortunate. And that's why I think it's important that we take to heart principles from the Bible about talking and listening. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next two session, sections. So the first thing we're going to talk about is just some principles uh, about talking and, and, and things we need to take into consideration uh, from the Word of God. James 3. James 3 is a uh, passage uh, that is very famous talking about the tongue. right? And it's not the tongue, the body part. Obviously, it's talking about the words that we speak, right? Because without our tongue, that's how we're able to speak the words that we do. James 3, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So it's a, it's a, it's a warning there that if you are somebody of influence or you're somebody of, of leadership, that there are bigger consequences for you for the things that you say. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So it's amazing that wor the words and our speech are so such a large part of, of us that if we're able to control the words that come out of our mouth, the Bible's saying here that you're able to be perfect, <laughs> which, which then goes on to the next thing that tells us that we're the tongue can no man tame. But that's how powerful uh, our words and the things that we sp say because they come, right? That's the manifestation of our spirit. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. So this is the, the analogy here that if you can control your mouth, you're able to control everything else, just like a horse is able to be controlled from the mouth. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm. So even a huge ship still has only a small steering wheel that can control the whole ship and it's likening our tongue to them whithersoever the governor listed, or wherever the governor wants, right, the desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So again, the analogy here that our words and the things we say is like a flame that can spark huge fires. I mean, if you think of the bushfires that happened in 2020, they would have just started in one place, but look at all the destruction that it creates. And I think it's so important for us, you know, who know the Word of God and are considering these things this morning, that we consider that the, the, the damage that words can do, right? And then we will take more care in what we say and how we talk to people because we realize the damage that it can cause, right? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So very strong words here from James 3 telling us to keep in mind like, hey, how we speak, how we use our words. You know, fire can obviously do a lot of good too. It can help a lot of people, but it can do a lot of damage too, and it spreads. You know, think about how gossip spreads, how people talk about it, it just spreads like wildfire. I mean, social media has really brought that to the forefront, right? Where we talk about things going viral, right? And this is the words that go out, and they just, you know, we have to be very careful of the things we say and the things we do. And, and like I said in the beginning of this sermon, that doesn't mean that we go the complete opposite. You know, we don't take part in society, we don't take part in social media and, and try and use it for a good influence. Sometimes, you know, we try our best to, um, you know, not offend and, and not do things like that. But, you know, we also need to weigh that up against 
the, the sort of light we want to share into the world as well. We want, to, we want to have an influence in the world too. But one thing I want you to take away from James, James 3 and, and talking about the tongue is to, to realise that t- words can hurt. You know, there's a famous saying that goes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Right? Which is not really true. You know, I mean, obviously you want the mindset of, hey, you know, you, maybe you can hurt my body, but I'm not going to let the words hurt me. But you don't want that saying to um, make you think that words have no effect on people. Like words are even more powerful sometimes than physical harm that you can do to somebody, right? You can just maybe say the wrong thing and completely uh, destroy their spirit. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 18, verse 14. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? Right? Now, why am I talking about a spirit here? Because words, words are the manifestation of your spirit, right? So I know words are, are not all that spirit is. So there's probably more to the spirit than just words. But in terms of how we hear the spirit, like, like I talk about the word of God, Jesus says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The word of God is how you're hearing the spirit of God. You say, how do you know the spirit of God is in church this morning? Because you're hearing the word of God, you know, coming from the spirit of God, which is the word of God. So it's the same with our spirit, right? Our spirit manifests through the words that we speak. So sometimes people think about, hey, the spirit is like your attitude, you know, the things, because that's how you you communicate your thoughts and you communicate your spirit and you communicate your attitude. So how do you know when somebody has a wounded spirit? Well, you know they have a wounded spirit by the things that they say. You know, maybe the things they say, they're discouraged. They say, oh, they're giving up. Oh, what's the point of it all anymore? You know, and, and this can then really affect people's health. And, and the Bible's saying here that if you have a good spirit, a positive spirit about things, it will actually sustain you through an illness, an infirmity. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? When their spirit is wounded, it's also even difficult for others to even sustain a person through their infirmity. So it's very careful. We have to you know, you know, realise this, that words can do a lot of harm. Proverbs 18, verse 19, look at this. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. And we think back to the story in Joshua 22, when people offend one another, it's so hard to rebuild that relationship. And that's what it's saying here in Proverbs 18, verse 19, that a brother offended, it's harder to be won than a strong city. Can you imagine that, that it's easier to go to battle, take up arms and take over a city than it is sometimes to win a person over that you've offended? And I think many of us have experienced that in our life where you know, maybe we've had a falling out with somebody um, and no matter what we say, no matter what we're willing to do, they're not willing to offer their forgiveness back to us. So we need to take care there. And we don't want to be that person. Right? We don't want to be the person that's so offended that we don't give people a chance to make up for the wrong that they've done. Proverbs 18, 21. Look at this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. All right, so not only, I think, this applies to salvation, where we believe on the word of God, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. It's not a works, lest any man should boast, but words in our lives as well can affect people in their health. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 24. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bone. So you can see there that you know words do have a can have a physical effect on people. And this is why we need to be so careful um, when if we know people's personal private information. You know, like gossip is a very damaging thing in a church where people are just talking about other people and, t- and sharing their personal and private information, you know, without the right intention. Right? You know, sometimes you need to seek counsel and figure out well, how do I solve this problem. You know, so the, what's the difference between gossip and actually taking concern for somebody? Well, it's, it's your intention, right? If you intend to hurt somebody or just to spread rumours about them or you don't really care about the person and you're just talking about their personal and private stuff, that's, that's gossip. You know, that's very damaging. It does a lot of damage within a church. It does a lot of damage in, in many different groups, you know. But sometimes 
you know, there are times where you do know something about something. You need to seek some advice. Maybe how to, how do, you know, somebody's in a bit of trouble. You need to figure out how do we uh, fix this problem. You may ask somebody for advice, but that situation, you know, the intention is different, right? We're trying to help somebody and people that are involved. If you know private information about people, you need to take very care, uh, great care what you do with that information and, and you know, whether or not it's a good idea to let that information out. You know, because you can do a lot of damage. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 11 verse 13. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful sp spirit concealeth the matter. Right? So, like I said, words can do a lot of damage. We need to take care. Ephesians 4, let's uh, just move on to another point. It says here that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But, and here's the part I want to focus on, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So this is talking about the church, everyone playing their part to build each other up within the church. And how do we do that? We speak the truth in love. So the point I want to make with this sermon here is, or with this uh, passage here is, sometimes people have the attitude that, you know what, I'm just going to say it like it is, I'm just going to tell the truth, and you know what, it's, it's too bad how it comes out, you know, you just need to take it, right? And that is not the attitude that the Bible speaks of when it talks about speaking the truth. It's speaking the truth in love. So there is actually a right way to speak the truth and a wrong way to speak the truth, right? We speak the truth in love. So you need to ask yourself, when I'm telling people what I'm telling them, do I actually care about the people that I'm telling them, uh, that I'm telling these things? And if you do, if you honestly do, it's going to come across differently in how you preach things uh, or how you tell people or how you say things. So you don't want to have the wrong attitude about saying things as well. Do you actually care about the person you are talking to. Uh, look what it says here in Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So I think this is a good verse to reflect on. Uh, when we think about how we talk, you know, a lot of people these days, you know, they just flippantly talk about things, you know, joke about things, you know, they swear and they say all sorts of things, they speak like the world speaks. The Bible tells us, you know, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. We ought not to talk like the world, you know, and yes, I understand that, you know, swear words aren't necessarily sinful in and of themselves, but there's a way that the world talks. You know, the world talks in a way that's, you know, uh, you know very... Um, uh, what's the word that's up top of my head? It's just, it's just vulgar. You know what I mean? You hear the way they talk. It's F this, F that, F this, F that. And we shouldn't be talking that way as Christians. You know, so let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It's not only the way we talk, but the, the topics we talk about as well. You know, sometimes the world will joke about, you know, the bedroom, joke about these things, and we ought not take part in those sort of conversations. But that which is, the, is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So we want our speech to build people up, not to tear people down. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So this is a great principle in the Bible where we think about hey, how we talk to people, and here the idea is we want to make our speech palatable to the other person, right? So we add salt here represents truth. And the Bible saying here we want our speech to be seasoned with salt, right? So when you season food with salt, what are you trying to do? You're trying to make it more appetizing for the person to receive. And that's what we do with our speech. We try and, you know, make it more appetizing. We try and share that truth in love and we put truth into our speech so it's more appetizing for the person to hear. So you don't want your speech always, you know, with, uh, is it always great seasoned with salt. We don't want always with salt, seasoned with grace. That's how some people talk, right? They just like 
just put all that truth in there and you know it can sometimes make people go Ugh, you know like oh, that's, a, that's a bit too much so we want to consider that when we when we speak Proverbs 15 let's look at a few other uh, principles of speech in the Bible as well principles of communication a soft answer turneth away wrath but grievous words stir up anger the tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness so you see here when somebody comes to you and they're upset you don't necessarily like you know uh, just immediately fire back you know, immediately get up in arms as well why because the Bible says here a soft answer turneth the way wrath and grievous words can stir up anger so if you keep that in mind if somebody comes to you then they're upset you know generally if you answer gently if you answer softly then you can de-escalate that situation so words can be offensive words can be defensive as well words can escalate and words can de-escalate look at verse 2 the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright so you see how just because you know stuff and you know wisdom that doesn't mean you always have to share that wisdom you always have to tell everyone what you think you always have to say it in every situation because the wise person knows when to use knowledge and uses it in the right way so sometimes there's a right way to use that knowledge and there's a wrong way to use that knowledge because the wise person knows how to use that knowledge and these are very difficult things I mean wisdom is very hard to know when to do things when not to do things right and that's why practice can sometimes make perfect if you're always reflecting on situations and you know, maybe you had a conflict with somebody you ought to reflect on hey what things could I have done differently sometimes people have a conflict and you know how they reflect on it they say oh you know what if that person didn't say that I wouldn't have had to say that to them or if that person didn't do that I wouldn't have re responded that way I only responded that way because they said X Y and Z rather than thinking you know what well, how could I have responded differently maybe if they said that and I said this it would have changed the situation and those are the things we ought to consider uh, when we when we talk second timothy 2 and the servant of the lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient so this is talking about leaders and pastors and preachers preaching the word but we can take these principles as well in our own lives saying hey the servant of the lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient in meekness in meekness with humility instructing those that oppose themselves if god peradventure will give them repentance the, the acknowledging of the truth and, and one way to stay humble is to know that you are susceptible to the same temptations and same struggles as everyone else you know and um, i think uh, sometimes uh, people in positions of leadership they forget that they think that they're uh, you know and they better take heed lest they fall because sometimes you see these you know really influential figures get into all sorts of sins and um, sometimes it's because they were not instructing people in meekness understanding their own flaws and uh, their own weaknesses last one here in, in the subject of talking it says here rebuke not an elder but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren the elder women as mothers the younger as sisters with all purity and the point I want to take from this one is you know different people are treated differently you know so you know yeah you might talk to your peers a certain way that doesn't mean you talk to people that are older than you that way that doesn't mean you know you may talk to you know you know your dad a certain way that doesn't mean you talk to every every older person that way so the point I think that is important here that you need to be wise about how you relate to different people because you're going to relate to different people differently depending on their level of authority whether they're older whether they're younger than you whether they you see each other eye to eye now ideally you get to the point where everyone is brother and sister in Christ because if you treat each other with charity and with love and respect you you, you probably won't be treating people differently you know you'll be just treating them with love and respect but you need to understand that different people take words different way and 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 we should think about hey what is our relationship with this person are you close friends or are you just acquaintances you know if you're just acquaintances you know maybe you won't be so loose about the things you say because if you are you may end up upsetting them with something you know you with your friends you may joke about and joke around but then you then joke around with somebody else that you're an acquaintance with and then you upset them because you know not everybody likes being the butt of your joke 
you know? So you need to think about these things and, you know, not destroy relationships ignorantly. You know, you, you wonder why. Like, you know, why don't these people like talking to me? Well, maybe they don't because of the way you talk to them. So you need to think about these things and, um, you know, help build those relationships. So are you close friends? Are you just acquaintances? Um, you know, how you deal with people in church? Um, I want to say this, you know, you know, sometimes we have new members in our church and, you know, you don't want to assume that you, the way you talk about things is the way you can talk about a new member, you know, because not everyone necessarily believes the same thing in this room. You know, sometimes new members come to our church, they just assume everyone in church believes the same thing I do. Not, not every, I wish everyone did believe the same thing I do. <laughs> but, you know, this is why I try and teach the things that I teach, but not everyone holds to my views. And sometimes you may throw out a comment, you know, just assuming everyone has the same standards, believes the same things, and you might actually upset somebody because they haven't got to that point where they've taken on that view. So this is something to keep in mind, especially in a church, you know, where, you know, doctrine is quite clear, the beliefs that we hold to are quite clear, but we still welcome people that aren't exactly, you know, 100% on board because, you know, there's room for them to grow. There's room for difference of opinion and civil discourse within the church and not everyone believes exactly the same thing but hopefully you know hopefully as you hear the preaching and you and you hear more often you'll start to learn these things and you may be swayed towards those positions um, in time so keep these things in mind and it's also good to apply the principles that we're talking about here in talking um, just with when you're attempting to convince somebody of another point of view so this can be applied even out soul winning you know, if you're trying to preach the gospel to somebody. But you know what? This even applies with things going on in the world today. You know, I know, you know many of you here, like I tell you, because we're part of this church, we see what's going on in the world. You know, we're awake to the agendas that are going on and the, and the lies in the media and all these things. And you want to share you know, what you see with other people, right? But you want to the same way that we relate to just others who are of the same view, you want to use those same principles when you talk to people that are of a differing view. You know, you want your speech to be, you know, seasoned with salt. You want to, you know, no corrupt communication to proceed out of your mouth. You want to try and edify the person and try and, uh, you know, teach them. You want to deal with people differently depending on how well you know them and your relationship with them. So these same principles can be applied to just how we try and communicate and convince people of another point of view. Now, zeal is good. Zeal and being passionate about things is good. But just keep in mind that zeal can often be perceived as, you know, um, like pushy. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes you're passionate about things and it's good to be passionate. But then you're passionate and you're saying, oh, you're like, why don't you believe this? Like, you know, can't you see it? Bloody banks and whatever going on in the world. <laughs> but, you know, if you have that sort of attitude, how it usually just comes across, and we've all done this, right? It just comes across as pushy, you know? So I think you just got to realize that and, you know, you, you refrain from how you um, share things so that it's more palatable to the other person. So that doesn't, you've you got to kind of channel that, that, uh, that passion into how you communicate with people. All right, let's go through a few verses just on listening and then we'll end it there. So there's obviously two sides of the equation of communicating and then there's also how you listen as well, right? So listening. Look at what it says here in Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Let me ask you something. Are you somebody that's easily offended? Do you easily get upset at other people? Are you, you always find that, you know, when you have a, building a relationship with somebody, there's always something that you get upset at. It's hard for you to... Well, the Bible says here, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. You know, somebody who's very easily offended, it shows a lack of spiritual maturity, right? Because if you're spiritually mature, it's like we saw in Joshua 22. You know God knows the truth. You know, you know, he knows what is actually happening. You don't need to get upset or be so offended at things that people say to you. And we live in a society where people joke, it's the snowflake society these days. Where, and why do they call it the snowflake generation? Because, you know, snowflake, you just got to touch it and it immediately melts. 
and it's referring to people that just immediately get offended at any little thing. But Christians shouldn't be like that. And you know what? It's a great way. You know, you easily get offended at things. It's a great way to make it really difficult to have true friends. You know, because friendship requires people to open up and people get offended too easily. It's very hard to, to, to make deep relationships with people that get upset very easily. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 27 verse 5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So isn't it interesting there that it's better for somebody to openly rebuke you than it is for somebody to love you and you, for you to not know about it. Right? And you probably think, well, I would rather people that love me just, you know, didn't say anything. Cause, but the Bible's actually saying, hey, open rebuke is better. Why? Because you can hear the feedback. You know what people are thinking and then you can change if you need to or you know, you know who are your real friends. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So don't you want real friends? You know, I'd hate to be surrounded by people who can't be truthful with me. You know, if they can be truthful with me, then at least I know um, where I stand with people and I can change if I need to. James 1 verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of of God. So if you hear something and you immediately respond, immediately get angry, you know you're not being spiritual, right? Because the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So what does the Bible want us to be? Let every man be swift. What does it mean to be swift? Quick. Quick to hear, slow to speak. But generally we're the opposite, aren't we? We are slow to hear, quick to speak. You know, and it's a bad habit from even myself as well. I'm sure many people where sometimes you're just waiting to get your piece in. You know, you're just waiting for them to finish so then you can say something. And, and that's, that's not a good habit to be in. You know, you've got to listen to what people have to say so that you can respond and, and, and actually have a good conversation. Proverbs 18, verse 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Right? So... You, and you, you know, this is about assuming what people mean by what they say, you know, and, and responding before you really understand what they're saying. And I don't think as well, it's not just about what people are saying that you want to understand. You also want to understand why they're saying it. Because you might go, well, I know what they understood, but do you know why they're saying it? Maybe you've misjudged the intention, right? So you don't want to answer a matter before you hear it. If you feel that something is offending you, you don't understand something, it's better to ask and to clarify. Make sure you understand what they're saying understand why they're saying it before you give your response and you know we want to be people that give people the benefit of the doubt you know you want to think about well why do people say this what's their intention and give them the benefit of the doubt that they have a good intention before you just give them a bad intention and um, you know you get offended and Proverbs 29 uh, last verse verse 20 seest thou a man that is hasty in his words, there is more hope of a fool than of him. See us now a man that is hasty in his words, there is more hope of a fool than of him. So we talked about principles of talking. You know, be careful with our words. Words can do a lot of damage. We want to um, take care with the things that we say and how we say things. We also want to be a good listener. You know, and hear before we answer. You know, don't jump to conclusions. Give people the benefit of the doubt. And as a warning here in the Bible, it says if we're a person that's hasty with our words, if we're too quick to speak our mind and we don't consider the things that, that, we, that we say, the Bible says there's more hope of a fool than of him. Now, I don't think fools have much hope, according to the Bible, right? So, you know, I don't want to have less hope than even that person has. <laughs> so, we don't want to be hasty in our words. We want to take care with the things that we say. All right? So... I hope you learned some good principles there today about talking, about listening. Make sure you apply these principles to yourself first. You know, don't ever sit in church hearing a sermon and, and applying it to other people. You know, people that aren't here. Oh man, I wish that person was here. They heard that sermon. They needed that. You know, I'm glad that person's here. You know, they're listening to that. They need that. You know, you need to apply sermons yourself and go, hey, you know, are there areas where I'm lacking that I can do better in communicating? Think back at times where you had poor communication. 
Do you reflect on that and think, hey, what could I have done differently? Right? And then you'll be a more effective communicator and there'll be less strife and more understanding in your life. Right? And hopefully through that, you'll build better relationships with the people in the church, will be better relationships with family, friends, but you'll also be a more effective communicator when you try and convince others of another position, right? Because we don't only want to just, you know, be cozy, build relationships here. We also want to be able to impact the world and be able to effectively reach other people and convince them to change their mind, all right? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Just pray, Lord, that you'll use this sermon, that it was a good reminder for people to really take care with the things that they say. But not so much care, Lord, that they are an ineffective witness for you. Lord, we need to be light in the world. And I pray, Lord, that you just give us wisdom to let our speech be always with, always with grace, seasoned with salt, that we can know how to answer every man. Uh, give us that wisdom, Lord. We need plenty of it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.